today we're in Galatians chapter 3 and it's a letter and it's the same theme it's not anything new that Paul is talking about specifically in chapter 3 uh, take a deep breath get some oxygen into your lungs allow the uh, Spirit of God to speak to you this morning uh, shut off any dis distractions if you are uh, gone a little stiff then get up and stretch and sit back down again uh, that uh, whatever it takes get yourself some water there you go and may the Lord bless your your hearing this morning um, as we look at Galatians chapter 3 I want to look at two things real quick the first one just to throw it in and then the second one we'll dwell on the first one is author's intent the second one is listeners insight firstly author's intent listeners insight now I don't want to be unfaithful to the text I don't want that you go away saying this was the meaning of the text this what I'm going to share with you this morning is my heart drawing from this text and taking it to you so that you may uh, be strong in your faith you may go on in your faith but when it comes to understanding the text it is purely between Paul and Peter this is a situation that is continuing between that conflict or that 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 confrontation that Paul made to Peter and I don't want to spend all the time on that because that is that that's the author's intent it, it stands alone it is important it must not be the, a lot of the times pastors leaders preachers speakers to be interesting to be uh, connecting to be relevant uh, if the passage stays within the biblical times and doesn't carry over into current times they leave it alone and they draw they draw something from there that might be of some relevance to us and then they they kind of uh, uh, fluff that up into something that uh, would be easier for us to uh, swallow. I don't want to do that. Although I want to be, uh, I want to encourage you this morning. I do want to cover that just a bit. Okay, so go with me to the text and then I will take you to what we call listeners insight. Listeners insight. So first, let's begin with author's intent. You are smart. You are intelligent. You are deeply connected to God, deeply connected to his word. And that is my understanding of you as my listeners. Uh, so I'm speaking to you from that regard. I'm, I'm not attempting to entertain or uh, tickle your ears uh, today. Uh, let's look at God's word. I'm taking you straight to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 uh, says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Great start. Thank you, Paul. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your very eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. Stop. Backstory. You remember what happened? Uh, Paul has... Uh, confronted Peter and and Peter was sitting with the with the with the Gentiles with the Galatians and he was sitting with the general people and then when the when the guys came from James from uh, from Jerusalem uh, he quite quickly got up and he left and he went sat down that became such an issue for Paul because it represented a push towards being Judaic uh, going back to the Judaic faith and he uses that opportunity to explain justification. He says, you are a Jew and you know, you should know, being a Jew, that you are not justified by uh, the works, which is the Judaic faith, uh, the law, but you are justified by faith. We talked about this last week. I labored on it and I hammered it. You, you got it. Uh, but then from there, he continues to say, not only do did you do that, but it, it it's worse. And he now turns to the Galatians and he's still harping on. Remember the first time when he said, I can't believe how quickly you're giving up on the gospel, how quickly you're swaying. Now, that is something I want to pick up on this morning. I, I, the, Paul's heart, Paul's a pastor. Paul's taught the Galatians and he's mastered. Uh, he's given them a mastery of the, of, of the gospel, of the doctrines, and he's established them, rooted, grounded them. And he's gone away. He comes back to find out that these guys have taken off in another direction. And who? But Peter and the other guys, I mean, if they don't know and live by the new gospel, by the new uh, uh, freedom that we have in Christ, then then what hope do we have for everybody else? OK, so he turns to the Galatians after he's spoken to Peter and he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has talked you out of it? It was before your very eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed and crucified. And then he launches into a bunch of questions, four questions. He says, let me ask you this one thing. Did you receive the spirit? That is the Holy Spirit, capital S. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works? Did you do something to impress God and he gave you the Holy Spirit? 
Or did you receive it by hearing it with faith? Are you so foolish? Again, he says foolish. Having begun by the Spirit, capital S, are you now going to be perfected, completed? Are you going to be sanctified by the flesh, in the works of the flesh, by your own performance, on your own, uh, in your own effort? Question number three. Did you suffer so many things in vain? Has your suffering, your persecution, all that you've gone through been for nothing? Last question. Does, you, does he who supplies the Spirit of God to you work miracles among you based on what you are doing? Or based on faith. So all the great things that God is doing in your life. Is it because of how good you are? Or is it because of the faith you have placed in him? Just like the way Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Author's intent. Let's get the meat of what he is saying here. I want to cover this and then go back to you and me. He says, oh foolish Galatians. Verse 3 again, he says, are you foolish? The word foolish is, uh, in the Greek is a word that explains mental laziness, not mental deficiency, not mental deficiency, but mental laziness. And he's, he's not saying that you are stupid. He's saying that you don't want to think, you don't want to understand, you don't want to take time out to, 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 to understand the word, to understand the gospel, to study God's word, to think through this stuff. You don't want to take the trouble to switch cylinders from flesh, from law to spirit and life. You don't want to make the effort to be trained spiritually. You don't want to make the effort to be effective and fruitful spiritually. So he uses the word mentally lazy, foolish, you foolish Galatians. You let somebody talk you out of it as quick as you, talk, you were talked into it. Know then that it is those who have those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. They are the true Jews, not you. You follow the law, that doesn't make you a Jew. Those who follow Abraham by faith, they are the true Jews. For seeing that God would justify Gentiles by faith, God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So the first person to receive the gospel was Abraham. Was he told about Jesus? No. What was he told? That righteousness comes from faith, not from doing the law. Righteousness comes not from performance, but from your position in Christ as you place your faith in Christ. So it centers around the faith. Verse 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed among, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Author's intent. Paul talking to Peter. Paul talking to Galatians. This is Bible times. Then he moves in to what Martin Luther uh, based his entire thesis on. And he and he's uh, and he nailed it to the door of the chapel and he and he uh, and he started what we call the protestant movement we are called protestants we don't even know what we're protesting but here it is for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse he says but the just shall live by faith the righteous shall live by faith so martin luther cracked the code again because what the direction that galatians were setting the, Galatian, the, the direction that Paul Peter was setting was a works direction. So having started in faith, they were now continuing and the continuation of it resulted in traditional Christianity. Traditional Christianity, rituals, ceremonies, being part and membership of this and membership of that. And, and, and all sorts of those ritualisms are what now become are called sacred. Now what are considered sacred. Uh, that's the direction, that's the end product of that tangent he was taking. Peter, Paul saw it. He saw something wrong there and he wanted to nail it. And this is why he says the just shall live by faith. Then from verse 15 to verse 29, he basically goes back to Abraham and he establishes for the Jews why faith was the basis of God's uh, God's uh, response, why, why faith is why we need to respond. Now, let's come back to you and me. Listener's insight. That was author's intent. Listener's insight. Let me ask you, verse two, verse 2. Let me ask you, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing of the faith? You foolish Galatians. What is wrong with you? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Give me the next few minutes to unpack this and take you to a place of, of commitment here this morning. Are you so foolish? Are you so foolish that having begun in faith, you're going to continue in the flesh? Having trusted God for your salvation, are you going to personally perform your sanctification? Your sanctification. 
Pastor Jerry, what does sanctification mean? Well, that's the next big word we want to learn about. First one was justification. How God declares a sinner righteous in his courts. Sanctification is how God changes, regenerates a sinner, a sinful human being, and makes him holy like Christ in behavior, in character, in, in mindset, in the thoughts, in the thought life, in the heart life, how we are becoming like Jesus. The process of becoming like Jesus, being set apart to be like Christ is the process of we, what we call sanctification. It comes from the word sanctify or to make holy or to be sacred. My brothers and sisters, the church building is not sacred. The rituals are not sacred. The elements are not sacred. You, my dear brother, you, a jar of clay, my dear sister, you, a jar of clay, of human flesh, you are what God has set apart. Because in you, God is doing the work of forming Christ. We call it spiritual formation. We call it Christ formation. Christ is being formed in you. Never get over that. Never get over that. This is the Christian life. Not just you are becoming Christ, but Christ is formed in you. Christ is being formed in you. Scripture after scripture, that Christ may be filled to the full. That we would be filled with Christ. That we should have the mind of Christ. Paul says, I labor like a woman who labors in, in labor pain until the baby is born. I labor for you until Christ is formed in you. That is the goal of every pastor. Not to grow the church, but that Christ may grow in you. That is the goal of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus may be formed in you. That is the goal of the Father, that he may see Christ in you. So when you started out, you started in faith and he said, Lord, save me, forgive my sin. So when you did that, God, by your faith, placed you in Christ. So when he placed you in Christ, Christ is on the outside. You are on the inside. You are positionally saved by being in Christ. You are saved. Christ goes to heaven. You go to heaven. Christ uh, is raised from the dead. You rise from the dead. Christ is glorified, you are glorified with him. Christ is seated on the right hand of God, that's the access you have to God the Father. You are in Christ. That's your salvation. God, by your faith, placed you in Christ and you are now in Christ. Now, by grace, God places Christ in you so that you may become like the Lord Jesus Christ. You, that Christ is formed in you so that when the Father looks at you, he not only sees Christ to save you, but he sees Christ in you. That is the glory of God's plan. That is the hope of eternity. That is the joy and the purpose of the Christian life. Our life on earth is a journey of becoming like the Lord Jesus. You may or may not like this. You may or may not be in sync with it, but this is the will of God. So foolish Galatians, having started in the spirit, Having started by what God has done in your life, that is give you faith, are you going to continue in the flesh? Are you going to say, oh, I can take it from here. You want me to be like Christ? Okay, let me study what Jesus is like and I'll do it. No, you can't. No, you can't. I'll say this one time. Nobody can be like Jesus except Jesus himself. That's why he gives you his spirit to live in you and be with you. So that Christ is formed in you day after day by faith in him who loved you and gave himself for you by faith. Every step of the way we are sanctified. We are becoming more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's that's our understanding. I want to pick up from this verse three. Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? The question is then, how did we begin? I'm going to answer two questions. How did we begin and how do we continue? Simple if you're taking notes. How did we begin? How does the person become a Christian? How does a human being become a believer, become a, a Christian? Let me take you to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 1 through 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins. So in sin, you were dead to God. 
you you didn't have spiritual life in you your spirit was dead to god small some small as spirit so you were dead in your sins in which you circle once walked you used to walk in your sin because you were dead in your sin following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air uh, the spirit of him who who's now works at the sons of disobedience among whom uh, you once lived so in sins you once walked circle once walked in in sins you once lived in the passions of your flesh circle once lived and number 2 number 3 carrying out the desires of the body and the mind so in sin you once walked in sin you once lived and you carried out you lived for you gave in to the desires of the body and the mind do you find something missing body mind something missing spirit spirit was missing why because you were dead you were dead in your sins so the spirit was down here you're supposed to be spirit mind and body but when the spirit died when there was spiritual death when adam died the spirit went down and the body went up and the mind was in the middle and now the body starts to dictate and tell the mind what to think what it wants what it feels what it desires and the mind gives the body what it wants and that's how you get the world around you today everything is once walked once lived carrying out the desires of the body carrying out the desires of the mind right but god circle verse 4 but god what about god being rich in mercy and being rich in love rich in mercy great love what did he do even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins that means we were dead to god we couldn't say anything to god we didn't even know our condition we didn't know how bad the cancer was we didn't know how far we were from god we didn't know that it was so dark around us even when we were dead in our trespasses he made us alive with christ he made us alive with christ so when jesus rose from the dead because our faith placed us in jesus in the death of christ we now are raised with christ so now our spirit is back to life the word in the original which uh, the word in the old english was quicken the word quicken to give life to resuscitate brought back to life so our spirit that was dormant our spirit that was dead to god our spirit that was not able to engage with god that he that who had created us was now brought back to life now you can have a spiritual life now you can be connected to god now you can have a you can have a communion with god you can have fellowship with god many people don't understand spirituality they mix it with mysticism they mix it with mystery uh it is a spiritual spiritual life can only cannot be explained it can only be told to a lover life person how do you explain life to a dead person you can't so even when we were dead in sins he made us alive made us alive how by grace by grace the grace of god worked in us and grace means the power the enabling power so grace is considered usually oh be gracious be gracious but grace in this is grace enabling the power of christ working in us by grace you have been saved and he raises us up circle raises us up with him in christ as he as christ is raised from the dead and he seated us with him okay so let's start that again verse 5 even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins he made us alive he raised us up and seated us say it with me he made us alive raised us up and seated us with him we have been raised from the dead that's the grave we have been raised up to life and we've been raised up to heaven and we've been seated in christ you're not just been raised to walk again you're not just been raised to live this life here on earth again but you've been raised to be seated in god and where is christ seated on the right hand of god that's not the right side of god that you have god in the middle right side and the left is open for uh, for election right hand means the authority of god you are seated on the right you are sitting on the right hand of god that means christ is the right hand he is the authority he is the the authorized uh, face of god to man so he's basically front and center we are in christ seated on the throne of god that's the very access we have to god almighty say it with me we have been made alive in christ we have been raised up and we have been seated in the heavenly places in christ so that 
he might show us off so that we would be a trophy of grace. How does a believer become a believer? How does a human being become a Christian? When God looks at that person and sees in their heart a desire to be saved, a cry for help, an open heart, a wanting to live, a wanting to believe. That's all God needs. As soon as he sees that, God gifts you his faith. God gifts you his faith. Look at verse 7. So that in coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace you have been, go slow, go slow, don't miss this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith didn't save you. Grace saved you. But what gave you the grace of God? The faith. What gave you the grace of God? Faith. Where did you get faith from? Start again. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, that's faith. And this, that's faith, is not your doing. This is not your faith. This is not your ability to trust. And this, your faith, is the gift of God. A person becomes a Christian. A person becomes a believer. When God sees a broken heart. When God sees a repentant heart. And God gives you faith. It is a gift. Now that gift is to save you. That gift is given to you so that you may respond to God. The very ability to respond to God. That means the very at the very start, the outset of the Christian life is the work of God. I'm going to go on a detour, okay? So don't let me lose you here. The very outset, the very beginning of the Christian life is the work of God. The continuing of the Christian life is the work of God. The culmination of the Christian life is the work of God. Nowhere in all of that is your work. Not of works that you should boast. There it is, verse 9. Not a result of works so that anyone would boast. Every single thing with regard to salvation from start to finish is the work of God. All God wants is a broken and repentant heart. The moment he sees that, that heart is gifted with faith. The faith that is a gift from God is the faith that becomes the most precious commodity, the most precious asset you have on earth. I'm going to say it again. Don't miss this. That faith that God gifted to you on the day you turn to Christ, that faith, which is a gift from heaven, is your most precious eternal commodity here on earth. That faith is what God values the most. That faith is what God invests in the most. It is the Bitcoin currency. It is the, it is the currency that God values the most. This is not your doing. It is the gift of God. So that faith is what got you saved. And now that faith is what is going to continue you in becoming like Christ. How does a believer become like Christ? How did we begin? I asked the question. We began by turning to God in, 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 in repentance. We turn to God in repentance and God gifts us faith. And he makes us alive with God, here with Christ. He makes us alive with Christ. And he, he seats us in heavenly places. By grace, you have been saved. This faith is the work of God, not a result of works. Okay, next question. How do we continue? So if we have been gifted faith and we began with the gift of faith, why would we continue in the flesh? Oh, foolish Galatians. Come on, man. Get your act together. Don't be so silly. Don't do this. It's not going to work. You'll get frustrated. You'll get frustrated. You'll feel guilty. You'll skip church. You'll blame the pastor. You'll look around everybody and you'll make everybody the reason why you are not able to walk with Christ. You'll, you'll say it's too hard. You'll say Christ is... Uh, you'll, find, you'll find silly things like the woman at the well. You'll find silly things uh, and, and excuses not to follow Christ. You'll look at the natural disasters and you'll look at the poverty in the world. And you'll say, where is God? Where is God? You know, how can a loving God send people to hell? You'll start making up all sorts of theological arguments to cover up for the fact that your heart is broken, not broken. Your heart is not repentant, that you didn't make an honest start to your salvation. Your salvation needed an honest start where you say, God, I can't do it. God, I can't do it. And God to a repentant heart gifts faith. Now, my brothers and sisters of covenant life, that is has to continue on a daily basis. You and I have to say to God on a daily basis, 
Be like Christ. Oh God, I can't do it. Be Christ to my wife. Lord, I can't do it. Live like him. I can't do it. Have his patience. Think like Christ. No, I can't do it. What I started in faith with a broken heart to which you gave me faith. I'm not going to change that now. I'm not going to try and finish what you started. Oh God, this is your work. I am your work. Verse 10, for we are, for we are his workmanship. You are the work of God. Don't take the work of God and make it your work. Let God finish his work in you. Let God finish his work in you. Created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. It's the opposite of verse 1. That we should walk in them. My dear brother and sister, from start to finish, you are the work of God. God is making, forming Christ in you so that you will think like Jesus, walk like Jesus, act like Jesus. Oh, my brother and sister, if only you would know how much God is invested in you. What does he need for you to complete the work he's doing? On an everyday basis, the same faith, the same faith. The moment you say, I can do this on my own. Two, there are two types of people. There are those who say, I can do this on my own. Patience, I can be patient. I can, I can. So you do it on your own. You get frustrated. You run out of steam and you, you cannot be like Christ and you give up. And then there are those who are saying, I can't do it. So neither in their own strength nor in God's strength do they want to do it. I give up on this marriage. I give up on this person. I give up on this child. I give up on this, uh, this dream. I give up on this prayer. I give up on this lifestyle. I can't do it. No, 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 no. You, yes, you can't do it. <laughs> we agree with you. But you can in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. You need to make that shift, but you're too proud to do it. So the same heart that, hu that humbled itself for salvation needs to be the heart that humbles itself for sanctification. The same faith. He says, you foolish Galatians. You foolish Galatians. Let me describe how precious that faith is to God. Let me describe how precious that faith is to God. Let me take you to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Oh man, I wish I could spend more time on this who by God's power are being guarded through faith who by God's power are being guarded through faith who by God's power that's you who are being guarded through faith till heaven comes you are being guarded through faith in this you rejoice though now for a little time if necessary you have been grieved by various trials oh yeah we have been so that the tested genuineness of your faith so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be precious more precious than gold so the tested genuineness of a faith, more precious than gold, uh, being tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor. See what God thinks of your faith. See what God thinks of faith. It's a gift to you. So what God has gifted to you, he's going to protect. He's going to shine. He's going to refine it. So when God puts you through the fire, don't take it personally. Take it positionally because you are in Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him with joy inexpressible, obtaining the outcome of your faith. Let me take you to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power. What? His divine power. Whose? His divine power has granted us. Granted us. You know what a grant is. It comes into the account and then you draw it based on the requirement. It has granted us to all things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Your battery, back, backup battery is full. Everything you need for life and godliness has been already granted to you. It is now under the grant under your name. It has been granted to you through the knowledge of him who called us out of, uh, called us out to his own glory and excellence. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So what do I continue in faith? Having believed in faith and started in faith, what do I continue in faith? The promises of God. 
Now I live on the promises of God. I trust the promises of God. I live out the promises of God so that through them you may become partakers of what? The divine nature. That's Jesus. As you believe in the promises and as you trust the promises of God, God makes you more and more like Christ. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Escaped. For this reason, make every effort to supplement. And here's where I want to give you something practical. So how do you continue? How do you continue in your faith? You take faith that God has given to you, right? And then you add, you supplement to that faith a few things. Verse 5. For, th for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with, number one, virtue. God, I need virtue. I cannot live without virtue. I cannot represent Christ without virtue. Today, I'm trusting you for virtue on a daily basis. With virtue, add knowledge. Oh God, I want to know you. I cannot know you on my own. I, I, I want to know your mind. I want to know your heart. Lord, and why am I praying? Because prayer expresses faith. Lord, I want to know you. I want to know your word. Show me opportunities to know your word better. Give me time. Allow me time within my schedule, within my my life and my relationships get me get give me the ability to spend time with your word so that my long enough for my mind to quieten down to actually hear your voice to knowledge add self-control oh god i have struggling people in my life i have difficult people in my life i have difficult situations in my life my body is tired from the work re re regime my, body, my mind is tired from dealing and coping with all the things that are falling out, falling apart around me. Oh God, I need self-control. I'm, I'm, I'm abrasive. I'm, I'm reacting to everything around me. I don't want to be a reaction. I don't want to, my, I don't want my life to be a re I don't want my day to be a reaction to the circumstances. I want to be in control. Lord, give me self-control. Help me to get a hold of my senses, of my emotions. Lord, I need your help. I need to be like Christ. Make me like Christ. To add your self-control, steadfastness. Don't give up. Steadfastness is the ability to not give up. It's called stickability. It's called faithfulness. Lord, I don't want to give up. I very easily want to give up because I am. I, my confidence is in myself. I trust you, God. I trust you that you'll give me the ability to stay like Christ. To continue to be like Christ. Let Christ be formed in me. To your steadfastness, add godliness. Oh God, set me apart from worldliness. Let no worldliness find pleasure in me. Let no worldliness find a place in my heart and mind. Let the things of God have a taste in my mouth. Have a, give me a taste, give me a hunger, give me an appetite for the things of God. And to godliness, add brotherly affection. Lord, give me the desire to have a few believers in my life. I find believers very boring. I find believers irrelevant. I don't want to open up to my, I don't trust them. Lord, give me a few, give me a love for brothers who, who, who love Christ. Give me a desire for the body of Christ. Give me a desire to serve in the body of Christ, with the body of Christ. Lord, give me love. Love is other centered. Love is sacrificial. To brotherly love, add, to brotherly affection, add love. For these, if these qualities are increasing, they are yours and they are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They keep you from being. So what you can do as you continue is add to the faith that God has gifted you with. Add to the faith virtue. Add to the faith knowledge. Add to the faith self-control. Add to the faith steadfastness. Ask him, pray, Lord, these are my seven things I want you to add to me. Brotherly affection and love. And then I will become fruitful. I will become effective in knowing Christ and becoming like Christ. Are you getting this? If you're irritated... If you're giving up, if you're guilty, then it's because you were trying to do it. God never expects you to be like Christ. God wants Christ to live his life in you. So it's a yielding. 
It's a giving way. Lord, take it. Somebody says something to you. You feel like responding with a knuckle. Lord, you go for it. A situation arises. You want to respond in fear. Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. It's a constant yielding of a God. Take the wheel. Now you, you ought to do it enough for it to become natural. That every situation, every response, every thought process is guarded and guided by the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of God in your life. The Bible says, talk, calls it taking every thought captive. Taking every thought captive. So my mind and my heart, my emotions and my will are all put through a sieve. And the Spirit of God begins to lead. God doesn't want you to be holy. God wants to be holy through you. You and I can't be holy. So it's okay. Don't worry. But do you have a desire for God to live in you? Jesus wants you to do this. He wants you to die. He wants you to die. Go lie down. Go find a grave and lie down. And let Christ live through you. And if you do that, if you do that, here's the promise. When Jesus comes again, the Bible says, you will see yourself coming with him. You will find that you, take your name, take your name, your whole name with the surname, that you were protected and guarded and guided and you were kept in Christ. So here on earth, you live the life of Christ. There in heaven is Jeremy Dawson safely kept in Christ. And when Christ appears, I will see myself for what I really am. That's how I become like Jesus. By allowing Jeremy Dawson to die a daily death. So Jesus may live in me. And when I, when I, when I see Christ again, I will not have lost anything. I would not have lost myself. The same faith that was a gift to you when you got saved is the faith with which you must live out your salvation. It starts with surrender. If you're thinking I can do it on my own, you're being like the Jews. And that's what Paul confronted. Not only do you trust Christ for salvation, but you trust Christ for his character. That Christ may be formed in you. I say it one last time. My dear brother, my dear sister, your plan in life is a career, is a bunch of relationships and a certain amount of money in the bank. Good for you. And I hope all goes well. God's plan for your life is that the Son of God might shine through every crack and crevice in your life. And that Christ may be formed in you. And that looking at you, the Father may take delight as he sees the Son in you. That looking in you, the Father may take delight as he sees the Son in you. That's when prayer becomes powerful. When I pray to God and God sees Christ in me, God is answering his son. And how many prayers of his son does God answer? I think you're getting it. I think you're getting it. Don't be frustrated. Don't give up. This Christian life is the best thing you've got. Thank you, Father God, for what you've taught us this morning. I praise you, Lord. Thank you for the patience with which your people have heard such a long message. I ask you would bless it and, and let, let the seed, give the seed a chance to bear fruit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Jeremy Dawson. And if you liked what you just saw, if it was a blessing, then hit the subscribe button. Come on, you can do it. Hit the subscribe button, uh, hit the bell so that we know you want to hear from us. Lots of videos coming your way, songs, worship, encouragement. Come on, subscribe. Let's take this forward and share with somebody you might know. Write a comment in the section below. But let's see you guys again. Come on, subscribe.